got uh, rule 9B, rule 9 says you have to plead with particularity. I think it's on track. Yeah, I got it. We know Claudine also recently lived there for about a year. Now, she was a crew member on board the HMS Bounty. That's the ship that went down about 90 miles east of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. News and I were learning more about Claudine from her aunt. News Channel 4's Sarah Stewart has been following the story, and she joined us now live. And Sarah, there were conflicting reports earlier today about Claudine's condition, right? Yeah, Kevin, that's right. We know she's been pulled from the water unresponsive, but tonight several different news agencies are reporting that she is dead. Claudine's aunt tells us her parents have left by to go to North Carolina, where her body was taken to a local hospital. The HMS Bounty was built as a movie prop, a replica of the real one well known for the mutiny aboard her in 1789. But a real life storm proved too much for the tall ship as she went down amidst Hurricane Sandy. Coast Guard video captured dramatic footage of the rescue of 14 crew members. One, when Oklahoma ties, was discovered dead. Hi there, my name is Claudine Christian. Claudine's parents live in Vianne in far eastern Oklahoma. Her aunt says she wasn't even aware her niece was at sea with the. Yeah. 
and failure to stay a claim, which is 12B6, and failure to join um, an absentee under Rule 19. Uh, we'll talk about a zip pro too. We won't be able to say that, but I just want you to know that um, if, a, if a party should be in a complaint that's not listed in a complaint, like a co-business owner, um, you can say, hey, um, they didn't include the co-business owner who would be uh, liable as well, financially liable. I'd like to dismiss the case and make them go back and refile again. So I just want you to know that is there. Um, in terms of 12H3, um, which would be on the exam, um, the defense of lack of subject matter jurisdiction may be raised at any time in the case, even on the first appeal. So I want to stress subject matter jurisdiction is special. Um, it can be raised at any point in during the trial, okay? And there's some catches to that, but that's the so if I say true or false on the exam, uh, subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction may be raised any time during the trial. You're going to say, true or false. All right. That's, what, that's how I get the questions. Because when people still miss it, you know why? Because they're nervous. It's fine. I'm like, I know they know this. I told them this day. Like, I've literally said questions in class, and they still feel nervous. That's why I hate I wish you could take, like, when I, our exam, you know, I graduated way over 15 years ago. I'm not going to say that number. Um, the school was a lot more open to different learning styles, so we had a two-week exam period, and this was like that long ago. I know a lot of people do it now, and we would just go to like a cross lounge, like our version of that, and there were exam proctors there who would show my ID, and I said, I'm going to take my, my sit-pro exam now, or I'm going to take my evidence exam. So it was up to me what days I took which exam within that two-week period, and I could take it anywhere in the law school. Isn't that crazy? And they had these on the code. I'm like, that's BS. And in my mind, I'm like, you know, I'm in like a little study cubicle in the library, and they still do it like this. And I'm like, are they studying? Or are they taking an exam? Put their books and all their notes out. Like I was, I was like so vocal as a law student because I thought it was such crap. I'm like, everybody's cheating. They're cheating. It's too tempting. Like you don't let me go in any room in the law school. I'll take that. That's how it was set up. Um, and it was nice. Some people screw themselves and procrastinate, and procrastinate, and then they'd be like at the end when they have to take some time to exams in one day. Um, so it did ch challenge your uh, time management skills. All right. So um, in addition to those 12B motions, which again you're trying to dismiss the case because of one of those um, defects, um, there are other three answer motions, three, three answer motions, um, which are contained in Rule 12, which I have listed. Um, one would be Rule 12E. Um, motion for a more definite statement, what is that, right? Um, this motion is discussed in your text, and it makes the basic point um, that, it, of course, the motion is rarely granted uh, because um, if the complaint is sufficiently vague, um, so that you can't respond, then you can bring a 12 v 6 motion instead and just have the case dismissed. But um, nevertheless, this rule is basically a carryover from common law. Uh, pleading rules, and allow the defendant to get some initial discovery um, done. So the motion is basically aimed at a complaint that can't be understood. So I need a more definite statement. What do you mean by this? Um, 12 F is a strike. A motion to strike is used very, very, very often. Um, it permits any party to strike um, a portion uh, by pleading, um, or an entire pleading, um, if it has redundant um, immaterial things or uh, stuff that's scandalous. Um, for instance, sometimes, even though it's unprofessional, we call the defendant nasty name, you know, this a-hole, or this, this cheat, you know, this crook. Um, so uh, there's a lot of examples that are given in your text of showing you uh, where Rule 12.5 uh, would apply. Um, and so I encourage you to look at that. And again, that's 12 ethical strike. Um, rule 12c, the last one, motion for judgment on the pleading. Uh, just like in the, in the in terms of ethical considerations or sanctions that can be imposed are available pretty much at every stage of the litigation process, um, a, opportunities for a judge to rule on a case are also available. So a uh, motion for judgment on the pleadings is what you would do in the trial phase of course summary judgment. Um, so it's, it's kind of the same thing, basically saying, why are we moving forward? Um, we don't need to move any forward. Like, for instance, if, if the plaintiff says, hey, there's a breach of contract, and the defendant's response and their reply is, well, I was broke, I lost my job, I didn't have the money, you're going to file a motion 12C for a motion on the ju judgment on the pleadings because there's nothing for the jury to decide. The plaintiff said there's a breach of contract, the defendant said, yeah, I lost my job, I didn't have the money. So what's the jury decide? The only thing left to decide is, you know, how much is going to have to pay back um, if there's going to be <coughs> damages attached to them not fulfilling the obligations under the contract. Um, so again, uh, Rule C permits a motion for judgment on the pleadings. Um, and again, you make it after all the pleadings have been filed. Um, so you can only make that after the complaint has been filed, the answer, and if the defendant ch uh, the plaintiff chooses to a reply. So again, judgment on the pleadings, motions can only be filed after the complaint, answer, and reply. Okay? Um, that's pretty much it. All right, so we discussed how long the defendant has to um, answer or file a pre answer motion. Um, now let's talk about the content of the defendant's answer, meaning what must the defendant's answer actually contain? We know Rule 8A tells us what the complaint has to contain, but now let's find out what the defendant, if you're the defendant's attorney, what needs to be in that answer. All right, so it's uh, governed by Rule 8B as in void. Uh, pretty wordy, which is why I wasn't OD. Um, but it generally provides that um, the defendant can answer the plaintiff's complaint uh, by either admitting to or denying the allegations, which makes sense, and raising a defense to the plaintiff's claim. So first, you either admit or deny knowing that in breach contract. As a matter of fact, you know, um, this is my defense to what you're saying. Um, so there are essentially two parts of the defendant's answer. In one part of the answer, the defendant, again, admits or denies the plaintiff's allegations. Part two, they raise any defenses they may have. Okay? With respect to admitting or denying the plaintiff's allegations, uh, Rule 8B2 through 5, so Rule 8B2 through 5, provides that in addition to raising defenses, the defendant can do one of four things with respect to allegations in the complaint. For exam purposes, yes, I want you to know all the Rule 12s. Uh, and outside of that, I just need you to know that Rule 4 governs service process. I don't care about the substance. Hey, rule 8 governs uh, what should be in a complaint. I don't care about all the little letters. The only letters I care about are Rule 12. That is it. All right. Um, so again, um, with respect to allegations in the complaint, there's four things that the defendant can do. One, as I said, admit to deny um, all or deny some, admit to others, um, deny that's brief, and then plead that you lack knowledge or insufficient information to respond. Meaning, I'm not really sure what they're accusing me of here. Um, and so that's essentially how that goes. Um, so in terms of the different types of denial, as I said, you can deny all or some of the parts of the allegations that have been filed against you. Um, there's actually different types of denial. So there's a general denial and a specific denial, okay? A general denial and a specific denial. Um, general denial is a very short document um, where the defendant just denies each and every allegation in the complaint or everything in a certain paragraph, okay? So you can say, you know, everything in that paragraph, I agree to, I get it. Because um, a lot of times these complaints, we did a, like a kind of a mini complaint for class, but when there's multiple counts, they can be pages long. Um, so you can do a general denial. Um, if you have Rule 11 and the Rule of Professional Responsibility, um, it's really, really difficult to imagine a case um, in which the defendant can generally deny all the allegations in the plaintiff's complaint. After all, um, there. If there's anything in the complaint that should be admitted, the defendant should admit it. Um, so some of it is, you know, um, like they'll do, when you learn discovery, they'll do what they call interrogatories. And they'll say, oh,
Uh, so you know, they did that, and then, and you know, to design that doll, um, failed to uh, validate. Now that's not true. So it's very rare that you're going to do a general denial with the whole document. Um, also, AB2 says that um, when doing a denial, it must fairly respond to the substance of the allegations. So you can't have to skirt around. You have to go ahead and um, address what they've said. Um, in terms of specific denials, the second category, if the defendant does not make a general denial, then the answer to approval will be contained in numbered paragraphs, okay? Corresponding to the complaint, which specifically admits some allegations and denies others. Um, the allegations that the defendant admits are not an issue, and the plaintiff does not have to prove facts for those at trial. Whatever you admit to um, in that process, then there's, there's no burden on the plaintiff to offer evidence at that point. People already said, about how do you do that? Or, yeah, I was, I was negligent, but I didn't do the contract. You know, yeah, I should have been a little bit more diligent in how I transported uh, the bananas um, to the factory. All right, so. Um, you have to be really, really careful making denials, um, so that's, which we'll see from the Zelensky case as well as reading it. Um, there are going to be some pretty bad consequences. Um, so, yeah, we're going to get to this, the Zelensky case. So, the other section of the answer will contain um, defenses to the plaintiff's allegations, so defenses, um, and that, um, all that means is uh, typically some of the defenses are like affirmative defenses, that's what we call them. Um, they are rule AC1. Um, I say this every year. <laughs> AC1 is awesome. It is the 19 classic affirmative defenses. Um, you should look at them. They're very important. Um, as we remember from the Jones v. Block case, one of the affirmative defenses is if you're on a, the plaintiff has exhausted all their administrative remedies. Um, so I don't want you to know all of the affirmative defenses, but I want you to, to be very, very familiar with them. I'm promising you and guaranteeing you I will ask you a fact pattern that says um, which of the following is an affirmative defense. So I'm blatantly telling you I'm going to ask you that over here. So, please understand. Affirmative defenses are always <coughs> Again, in rule AC1. Please bye bye. AC1. All right. Zelensky. Are you ready? All right, go ahead and get the fact. Um, so on February 9th of 1953, um, a motor-driven forklift operated by Sandy Johnson that was owned by the defendant, and that Sandy Johnson was an agent of the defendant, while Sandy Johnson was an agent of the defendant, injured um, Mr. Or injured the plaintiff um, because they crashed into each other. And, um, well, those are the facts. Okay, perfect, yeah. All right, so we have um, plaintiff again, and she's ended by working on a plant, I'm sorry, working on a pier from the forklift um, he was driving collided. Yikes, with another driver from the forklift was Sandy Johnson. Um, Johnson's employer uh, was liable under the respondent superior um, if Johnson had been negligent. Um, so what did the plaintiff do wrong here? Yes. Um, solely sued the wrong person. So we know the plaintiff got um, Philadelphia Piers um, with PPI operated the lift and employed Johnson. Oops. In fact, the business of losing freight, <laughs> excuse me, previously conducted by PPI had been sold to Carlo Contractors. How are they supposed to know that? Sorry, CC1, a year before the incident. So clearly PPI was not the owner at the time. Um, PPI leased the truck forklift to um, Carlo Contractors and therefore PPI technically owned um, but did not operate the forklift um, in question. So um, the employee, Johnson, was transferred to work with CCI basically without the employees um, knowing. So this is really, really critical in this case um, because only the operator under respondent superior, the operator of the forklift uh, would be liable uh, for Johnson's um, injury. So it's really important um, in terms of who was, who was, who was in charge of the operation. So because the sale had not involved any changes in operation or insurers, um, some employees, again, were unaware that it had even happened and a change had occurred. Um, so as she stated, the plaintiff sued the wrong party, um, but didn't realize it until after this is the part that hurts. The statute of limitations um, had run out on a suit against the right defendant, meaning um, they sued PPI, but they should have sued uh, the Carlo, what were they called? Um, Carlo Contractors, PPI. Um, so you're kind of screwed here. Statute of limitations run out, you sued the wrong person. What on earth do you do? Um, so attorney uh, Tavera, what did the defendant's denial in his answer provide? What did he say? Um, they, defied, d they denied it all mm -hmm. um, without being specific as to what they were denying. Um, Which portion of the complaint did they deny? Do you remember this? The part, um, okay, paragraph five, uh -huh. um, where they said that. Um, Can you read the motor driven vehicle known? Do you write that paragraph? A motor driven vehicle known as a forklift or chisel was owned and operated and controlled by the defendant's agents, servants, and employees. Excellent. Okay, so um, we know the plaintiff, like you said, alleged that the forklift um, was owned and operated by the defendant. Um, the defendant denied um, those portions of the allegations again contained in paragraph 5 of the complaint, um, which uh, attorneys have read. What page is that on? Is this where your colleague from 437? 437. Okay, awesome. Um, so um, the court, in terms of the court holding a reason in this case, the court, as we know, granted uh, the plaintiff's motion um, to admit that PPI um, owned and operated the lift. Um, what kind of motion did they file? Okay. Filed a motion for equitable estoppel? Yes, for equitable estoppel. So essentially, um, you will not get tested on that motion, but the concept behind it is what it sounds like. It would be in the, um, in the interest of fairness and justice uh, to allow in these circumstances. This was an honest mistake that was made. Um, and so it's, it's one of those discretionary motions that judges can bend the rules a little bit when the statute of limitations has run out and an honest mistake has been made. Um, so the court, again, granted the plaintiff's motion to admit that PPI owned and operated the lift. The court granted, uh, gave three reasons basically for approving the plaintiff's motion, even though the statute of limitations had run out. Um, the, one was the denial with respect to uh, paragraph 5C. Uh, the complaint was ineffective, the court said, because the plaintiff uh, won't know which defense to be prepared for, right? Um, the court says the defendant did a general denial of everything um, in paragraph 5, and the court says you need a specific denial of certain parts of paragraph 5, um, C, in the plaintiff's complaint. Um, the court goes further to say that um, it's unclear um, what exactly the defendant is denying. Um, are you denying that the truck's ever collided, um, or are you denying that you operated the truck, right? Uh, so Rule 8B2, the court said, requires much more detail. I need to know what I'm committing myself to the end of my chart. Is it that the truck collided or that I wasn't operating it. So a specific denial or admission of each part of paragraph 5 could have let the plaintiff know who actually operated the truck. <coughs> the defendant should have admitted to some things in paragraph 5 and denied others. So this is a really, really good example of why it's important not to just, you have to be very careful in how you're responding to these complaints. And if you are indeed, um, if you do a general denial, make sure that everything in that part of the uh, complaint is indeed something that you want to deny. And that's why it's much safer to do specific denials of specific parts because you don't want to overlook something. Because if they had done specific denials more precise in paragraph 5 of this complaint, 5C, they would have realized they had the wrong operator. So you want to be very meticulous as an attorney uh, when you're responding on behalf of your client um, in any type of pleading. Um, the court emphasizes that uh, Rule 8B uh, re requires, uh, and I'm just going to read the right quote from the case, a party shall state in short and plain terms his defenses to each claim asserted and shall admit or deny any evidence upon which the adverse party relies. 
denial should shall fairly meet the acceptance of the evidence denied. When a pleader intends in good faith to deny only part or a qualification of an averment, he shall specify so much of it as true, and the material shall deny only the remainder. Um, the second reason the court gave for allowing PPI, the plaintiff's motion to admit that PPI only operated the court, um, is that they said the defendant failed to correct Sandy Johnson's deposition testimony um, when he was employed by PPI. And then third, they said that PPI answered an interrogatory ina inadequately uh, by saying that PPI's employees, rather than TCI's employees, turned the matter over to an insurance carrier. An interrogatory happens during this discovery phase, and it's just this kind of song and dance where uh, the plaintiff asked the uh, defendant a series of questions, and then the defendant answered, and the defendant asked, asked the plaintiff a series of questions. Were you driving down Eastern Parkway at 5 p.m. on Sunday, April 19, 2016? Yes. Were you? So it's just a way of getting some of the basic information um, that on the record saying, okay, we don't have to deal with this part at trial. We've already admitted to this. Here's where the, here's where the disconnect is uh, when the actual collision happened. And so um, it was during this interrogatory the court said that um, the PPI should have answered, they answered basically the question inaccurately. Had they answered the question accurately, again, this mistake would have been found. Um, and so an interesting case um, because it talks about the importance of um, the specific and general denials and the implication that trial when you don't do it correctly, um, it can happen pretty dire um, circumstances. Um, I think that's it. So, anybody nervous about the process? So, I'm gonna back up briefly to the very first week of classes, and all we're doing, all you're leaving the semester knowing is how you file a case in civil court. You know that now that you're gonna file a complaint, which is a plea, right? Um, that plea has to adhere to Rule 8A. Um, if it has to deal with fraud, it's gonna to adhere to follow the rules of 9B. Um, we know that um, once that complaint is filed, um, the defendant's gonna respond with specific and general denials, and then the plaintiff, if they want to, can respond with a reply or an answer. So you have complaint filed, defendant's answer, and then a reply, right? Um, so it's really interesting seeing how this trial process works. So we know as a plaintiff's attorney, before I even submit the complaint, I'm gonna do my research and say, where can I file this case based on the fact of my client cases? Can I file it in Kentucky, or does it have to be filed in Indiana, or New York, where can I file this case? Who has personal jurisdiction over this defendant? And then you're gonna say, okay, I know what state I can file it in. Where within those states, those two states I've narrowed it down, who can I file it, what venue, right? Um, and then you're gonna say, okay, now which court? Federal court or state court? Subject matter jurisdiction. Once you have that information, you're gonna put it all in a complaint, you're gonna get a copy of the summons, you're gonna give it to a service processor, and you're gonna hand it, they're gonna hunt the defendant down. First, you're gonna try to save money and not do a service processor, and mail it to them with the waiver of process form, hoping that they'll say, you know what, we'll have more time to answer this complaint and get our litigation together, our money to pay for an attorney, um, you know, for the full trial if it goes to that, so we're gonna sign that waiver of process form. If they don't sign it, um, they have 21 days to respond um, after the actual service processor has hunted them down and given them a copy of the complaint. Um, I've had some hilarious videos I keep forgetting to show you, but it's a celebrity trying to evade um, service of process. One in particular, I think I know how to pull up quickly, but I want you to see why it's important, because until their service papers, um, that 21 day window doesn't start to accrue. So um, Chris Brown, the is notorious for avoiding service of process because he's been sued for stuff. I'm gonna show you a really quick example. I don't remember his name, but she's not. But you see how the process is working? So now you just know how to, like, you actually go file a little claim in small claim court. It's cool, like your family's going through the meeting. Um, so service of process, it comes up. Wrapper, um, shoe tidy. The documents by two men. That's crazy. Thank <laughs> you.